Sylvia Chase, Jim Paymar, Mark Thompson Weather, Tom Nettle Sports, Wayne Shannon with commentary. And now from the West's most honored newsroom, the News Center for Northern California, this is News Center 4. Good evening, everyone. Japanese officials say they will seek an emergency meeting next week to urge the Reagan administration to drop harsh new trade sanctions. Today, Reagan officials announced tariffs that will double the price of $300 million worth of Japanese electronic exports to this country. It's to punish the Japanese for reneging on a trade agreement and dumping computer chips on the world market. That has hurt U.S. companies, many here in the Bay Area. The Japanese maintain they did not violate the pact. The government of Japan has taken all the available measures to implement the arrangement. Therefore, Japan finds it uh, deeply regrettable that the United States has now announced unilateral measures against Japan. The tariffs are scheduled to go into effect in two weeks. The administration's move is being applauded by Silicon Valley chip makers who've been hit hard by Japanese competition. Industry spokesman Andy Procassini thinks the tariffs are right in line. Uh, these are the types of sanctions that the, under, the Japanese will understand are sanctions, and yet they're not so severe that they should find them crippling. Advanced Micro Devices in Sunnyvale is one of three American companies that sued the Japanese last fall for illegal dumping. The company has lost more than $100 million in the last two years and laid off 500 employees last fall. Senior Vice President George Scalise says the tariffs will have far-ranging effects. It's going to level out the playing field for all the participants, both the U.S., the Japanese, and the European and other competitors. And that's what we're looking for, a level playing field. Fair competition. Fair competition. The tariffs will affect some of the most popular electronics products, like TV sets, stereos, and microwave ovens. But the Reagan administration was careful to pick products that are also widely available from non-Japanese manufacturers and therefore won't hurt U.S. consumers. Greg McConnell, who was looking for a personal computer, wasn't phased by the news. I'll buy one of the cheap clones that are around that you can get. Um, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, and the parts are made all over now, um, particularly in Korea and Taiwan now. And products like VCRs, on which the Japanese have a corner on the market, will not be affected by the tariffs. Not a trade war, but a real war could erupt in the Aegean Sea in less than two hours. Greece has warned Turkey if this oil exploration ship enters Greek territorial seas, it could be attacked. The ship is due to arrive in the danger zone at 1 a.m. our time. In San Francisco, the Greek Consul General said Turkey is trying to take over Greek territory. Greece will defend its rights and uh, as I said earlier, we should not accept this kind of exploration because that would be the beginning of a partition of the area what exactly Turkey would like to have. In the event of a war, Greece will shut down all U.S. military bases on Greek soil. That is because the last time Greece and Turkey fought, the U.S. jammed all Greek military communications. In the latest chapter of the Evangelist feud, Jimmy Swaggart said today that former PTL chairman Jim Baker has yet to repent for his sexual encounter with Secretary Jessica Hahn. But Swaggart did offer some Christian charity. If he truly repented and walked straight, I would do anything and everything within my power to be of service and help to him in any way that I could. If you did meet with uh, Jim Baker, what would you say to him? I would tell him, Jim, uh, I love you. And uh, I'm your friend, I want to help you, and I was not trying to take over PTL. I had absolutely no thought like that in mind whatsoever. Swaggart also said that Baker's assistant, Richard Dorch, helped cover up the encounter and should resign from the PTL club. Today, a man close to the scandal said Baker's secretary was drugged, used, and discarded by the former PTL leader. Businessman Paul Roper says Jessica Hahn told him someone drugged her with wine before her tryst with Baker. Also, late word tonight that Hahn has been offered $350,000 to pose nude in Penthouse magazine. Publisher Bob Guccione says, quote, she's been doing God's work long enough. Now we're asking her to do work for all humankind.
One of the women found shackled in the basement of a Philadelphia home on Wednesday gave a grisly description today of her ordeal. Agnes Victoria Adams says she was imprisoned by Gary Heidnick for 24 hours in this house. Adams says she wasn't beaten, but she saw him torture other women and even make them eat human flesh. He put screwdrivers in their ears and they um, fed them dog food and human beings. A human being? Yes. He didn't say nothing. He didn't do nothing to me. He didn't beat me or nothing, but he had beat the other girls that I was um, handcuffed by behind my back, and I was had chains on my legs. But I'm glad to be out there. Gary Heidnick is charged with murdering one woman. Officials say he was often on the prowl for mentally retarded black women and had been treated for mental problems himself. It's now official. Huey Lewis, the Grateful Dead, Tony Bennett, and Turk Murphy won't be part of the Golden Gate Bridge's 50th birthday party, and neither will concert promoter Bill Graham. Graham dropped out of the May 24th celebration because the bridge won't be closed all day for a bridge walk. His concert will be replaced by a high school marching band. Still no decision on an early morning bridge walk. Well, as promised, today President Reagan vetoed an $88 billion highway bill. The president even held a highly unusual vetoing ceremony at the White House. The bill would have paid for numerous highway and transportation projects while raising the speed limit to 65 on some rural highways. But President Reagan says the bill was just too expensive. Bill is a textbook example of special interest pork barrel politics at work, and I have no choice but to veto it. And that is the veto on top of the bill. The president is now trying to win enough votes among his Republican allies to prevent Congress from overriding the veto. Highway officials in California say the veto could delay some major road projects. But as for the speed limit, California drivers don't seem to be too concerned that it's not going up. New Center Force Carl Sonkin reports. On the Bayshore this evening, drivers were overriding President Reagan's veto of the higher speed limit, zipping past a Channel 4 news car doing 55. Not far from the freeway, drivers fueling up for the night reacted with words. You're, you're endangering your life if you drive 55, basically. But the traffic moves faster than that. Everybody does at least 65 or 70 anyway, so I might as well legalize it. Not everyone wants a higher speed limit. Well, uh, I've been driving now for a couple of days on the California highway, and it's too fast for me. Larry Scott admits he's driven faster than 55 miles an hour a few times in recent years, but that's in his own car. Scott's employees will drive 55, regardless of what President Reagan or Congress do. Scott's president of Consolidated Freightways, one of the nation's biggest trucking companies. He says 55 is fine for the big rigs. Safety is a very important factor. We've, we've had some phenomenal safety statistics. And, uh, of course, it really paid off when the fuel crunch came in the early 70s. We found that, uh, that with a little engine regearing, it was economically sound to stay at 55. Scott's told President Reagan how he feels. We'll lead the drive to keep a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit on trucks. On the northbound Bayshore tonight, I found only one 55-mile-an-hour sign between Menlo Park and San Francisco. That's 30 miles, and it looks like it'll be a while before that lone reminder has a chance of getting changed. I'm Carl Sonkin, New Center 4. In Sacramento, Governor Dick Majan vetoed a $76 million school spending bill today. The governor calls the bill a hoax because it doesn't specify where the money will come from. The bill's sponsor, Senator Barry Keene of Vallejo, says there's plenty of money in the state surplus, but that the governor just doesn't want to spend it on education. In Los Angeles, the money feud between actress Joan Collins and her estranged husband is hotter than ever. Today, the couple negotiated over property and alimony for eight hours, but left the court without an agreement. Former Swedish rock star Peter Holm wants $80,000 a month in alimony. Colin says he's already gotten almost $2 million, and that's plenty. He was paid. I lived up to my part of the bargain. It was something that we agreed between us, very firmly, and he's not living up to his. And that is why we are coming to go to these very unfortunate and petty proceedings, which I find exceedingly upsetting. Now, Holmes says the $80,000 a month would still force him to cut back on his lifestyle, but he said... He, He'll live with the hardship out of warmth and compassion for his wife. 
In an East Bay courtroom today, the man accused of killing Hayward police officer Benjamin Wooster was arraigned. Luis Chavez told the judge he'd like to represent himself. Chavez is charged with first-degree murder. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. Police say they're angry that Chavez was free after serving only seven years for a double murder in Los Angeles. The L.A. Sheriff's Department says a man now in jail in Alabama is linked to one of the South Side serial killings. Officials say Donald Siebert killed Gidget Castro, whose body was found in this alley over a year ago. She is one of 17 women believed murdered by the South Side killer. But Sheriff Sherman Block says the killings are not the work of a single person. It was our belief that the so-called so South Side killer was more than one person. That while there were similarities in these homicides, that they did not appear, in our opinion, to be the work of a single person. And there have been people arrested now in several of the individual murders, which uh, tends to support that theory. Siebert is also linked to another L.A. County murder. He is serving time in Alabama for the murder of a woman there and is charged with the murder of four others in that state. A search is underway tonight for a San Jose woman who disappeared five days ago after telling her husband that she was going to the store. 22-year-old Rainy Renette Martin drove away Sunday with very little money and not much gas in the car. She left behind her eight-month-old baby and her husband, who's desperate to find her. Her husband says that Rainy had been depressed lately after a series of accidents. <laughs> Four hours down and 20 more to go in a San Francisco radio station's Leukemia Curathon. KGO Radio has raised more than $2 million in the past six years for leukemia patients. And our Jim Paymore was a guest on the fundraising radio show tonight. You can still call the station to pledge donations until 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Good Did you cars? have your ear? Did you have your hand on your ear? Uh, I was doing a radio thing tonight. That's your radio deal. And now, that. from KGO Radio. That's you good. know KGO Radio. You do the talk shows. Once, there, in, once in a while, yeah. It's a fun place. They're yeah. great people. We'll be, Wayne and I will be on tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Okay. There you go. So that's... All uh, the New Center 4 viewers call in tonight, tomorrow, and... Uh, that'll be fun. Do you get a fun. chance to actually talk to viewers? I don't think so. You, uh... It's not viewers, listeners on radio, Mark. <laughs> no, I know that, but, uh... Okay, we're digressing. <laughs> we're digressing. This is trouble. I have a lot of information. All right, let's go right to the visuals. Here they are now. Beautiful shot. Balmy night, indeed. 56 degrees in San Francisco. Barometer's 30.08. Yes, that's high. High enough? to give us a little offshore flow. Nice weekend. You will love it. We'll run down all the spots around California in just a moment. First, I want to run down some spots in other parts of the nation. Showers now beginning to move offshore, but if you're headed to the east, it'll be coastal sections of the eastern seaboard. So right along the immediate coast, we'll continue to see showers right through the weekend. And those kids on spring break around Fort Lauderdale, rain all weekend long around southern and central Florida. This is the next big blast of air. We talked about it last night, dropping right out of the north. Temperatures in the teens tomorrow. It will be wintry indeed, blowing and drifting snow from the Dakotas into Nebraska, Wyoming, and the eastern plains of Colorado. Now the west, and you'll see that offshore flow has entrenched itself over the eastern Pacific. High pressure, the clockwise circulation, bringing winds from land to sea, will promise us fair skies, warm temperatures right through the weekend. It won't be until next week we begin to see the westerlies break through to perhaps give us a change in the weather. Rain is possible by middle of next week. Daytime highs tomorrow. Central Valley will be bright sunshine. 70s there. Lake Tahoe near 50 degrees. Yosemite where there's a spring fest I think going on up there. It should be a lot of fun at Badger I believe. 67 for the daytime high in the valley. 67 or 70 degrees around Monterey and near 60 on the north coast. The deserts of California should get to about 85 even 90 degrees. Bay Area locations. Stinson, I think, will get about 68, 70 degrees. 70s North Bay and Marin, 70s San Francisco, 70s Peninsula, 70s South Bay, 70s East Bay, 70s over the warmest interior valleys. Clear and starlit tonight, 30s, 40s, and 50s overnight. Tomorrow, look for bright sunshine, those northerly winds. Again, that's an offshore flow that'll bring us temperatures by the coast in the mid to upper 60s, near 80 in the warmest spots. Fair through the weekend in the high Sierra with daytime highs in the upper 40s. The five-day outlook, bright sunshine for the weekend, and then the westerlies break underneath oh. for next week, bringing us a change, perhaps rain, by Wednesday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. You do a great job banging that board. I get into it a little overzealous once in a while. Thanks Call a lot, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, thumpers or dogs, man's best friend may be the dog, but what's a dog's best friend? In one case, at least, it may be the dolphin.
Ellen Maynard has the story tonight from Florida. Three days a week, Kai works here at Disney's Living Seas exhibit. He's not part of the show. Kai stays behind the scenes to help his owner and dolphin trainer, Gretchen Jacobs. Kai took a liking to these aquatic adventures when Gretchen was training dolphins in the Florida Keys. He started chasing them, they started chasing him, and that surprised us too because dolphins are real cautious. Normally, you put something brand new in their environment, they go the other direction. But it's like there was this immediate attraction. That was two years ago. They've been doing it ever since. Kai is basically a mutt, but he must be part sheepdog, judging by the way he tries to herd the dolphins like a flock of sheep. But that isn't easy when the only stroke you know is the dog paddle. They tease him incessantly. They'll sit underneath him. They'll try to swim as close to him as they can without him touching them. They realize that he doesn't have a chance. He's got the best of both worlds. I mean, he can come in here and he can play and he can have a good time. But he doesn't have to stay here all the time. He can also then go home and, and enjoy the things that there are at home. So I think he's a pretty lucky dog. Ellen Maynard reporting for NBC News. Tom Nettles is here with sports, and the Warriors are continuing to do well. They are, Emerald. The Warriors won another tough game tonight, this time on the road up in Seattle, and the win puts the Warriors two games ahead of the Sonics in the Pacific Division standings, the battles for third place, and it was a battle all night tonight. Joe Barry Carroll at 18 points gets the hook right here. The Warriors caught and passed Seattle 98-96. They led by three later in the game, and look at the shot by Eddie Johnson with Sleepy Floyd all over him. Tied the game 103. Now we're inside a minute. Watch this inside. Sidney Floyd will give it off. Rod Higgins, who led the Warriors with 23 points. They're up by two, but Dale Ellis gets it back for Seattle. We're going right down to it. Sleepy Floyd put a free throw up. There's the desperation for Seattle. Does not go. And that's a happy George Carl and a bunch of Warriors walking off the court with a win. In Chicago, well, they're not the Blues Brothers, but they're a reasonable facsimile. We're watching the Celtics against the Bulls. The Celtics on the fast break. Here it goes. Kevin McHale on the end of that one for the layup. He had 21 points. Michael Jordan was really shut down tonight. Good layup there, but he had 22 points only. In the game, he averages 37. Larry Bird, 41 points. The Celtics broke a five-game losing streak on the road. Also won tonight, winning tonight Phoenix and Philadelphia, and Indiana, Cleveland, and Utah Jazz. Tom Davis left Stanford, remember, last year basically to look for better players to coach. He found them at Iowa and led the Hawkeyes to a 30-5 and five season and from sixth place in the Big Ten to a sixth ranking in the nation. Today, Davis was named as the Associated Press's National Coach of the Year. The two more glamorous of the games tomorrow, the, the one of the two that's most glamorous, obviously has to be number one UNLV against third-ranked Indiana in the NC2A tournament. It features the two most talked-about coaches in America, UNLV's Jerry Tarkanian, one of the mellowest in the sideline demeanor, traditional sucking wet towels. Indiana's Bobby Knight is inning but mellow. And a good question put the UNLV players today. Would you like to trade places with the Indiana players? I don't go for too many people telling me off and grabbing all my clothes and stuff, so I don't think I could play for Bobby Knight at all. I know what Bobby Knight's like, and he's, he's a pretty tough customer. He, he's done well. You know, he's winning, and I think that's, that's the main objective, to win games. The other game, of course, tomorrow will be Spiggy Syracuse against the Cinderella team of Providence. We'll go to the Giants now. They, in spring training, were winners again today. They beat Chicago 7-6, to six, their 16th win against just six losses. Candy Maldonado had three hits in the game. And the A's finally got some good pitching today, but they lost one to nothing to Cleveland. Tom Candiotti tossed a four-hitter at the A's for Cleveland. He's the knuckleballer who won 17 games last year. The scoring in the fifth, Andre Thornton knocks in Joe Carter. That came off Joe Jose Rio, who was the losing pitcher. Here's Jose Canseco. He had two hits in the ball game, so Big Jose continues to hit well. So the A's actually only gave up six hits today, but again, one to nothing losers to the Indians, and it's that pitching that the A's are worried about. In terms of Players' Championship golf down in Florida, it's still raining. Only 72, pl well, 72 players did not finish their rounds today. Steve Jones, probably haven't heard of him. Not many people have has the lead. Okay. All right. And the Warriors so. coming on again. Yeah, that's good news. Well, coming along tonight from the News Center, Wayne Shannon says don't call ahead for reservations. Few are called, but too many answer. According to police in Redwood City, a woman was unaware that her drug supplier had been arrested. So when she called him, she got the police instead, and they got her. And just for you tonight, Wayne Shannon explains. Wayne. Thank you, James. Well, I guess there's only one major update on the Jim and Tammy Faye front.
That being that according to an investigator, Jessica Hahn was flown down to Florida seven years ago to see Jim Baker tape a show, not expecting to meet him, and when she got there, was ushered into a hotel room and given a glass of wine that, to quote the story I read, made her ill, end quote. A hint of something diabolical, perhaps? After that, of course, hanky-panky set in, and the rest is history, give or take that glass of wine that was obviously not a product of California. <laughs> Which brings us to another breakdown in communications, this one according to the Redwood City PD, a woman who called a fellow up who was, how shall we say, in the retail recreational drug biz, but unbeknownst to her, had been busted. The cops then tapped the guy's phone to see if any fish would continue to bite, and sure enough, this woman calls, the voice she gets says a deal can be made. She shows up at the cop's office, mind you, and gets arrested after buying 800 beans worth of Coke from one of Redwood City's finest. Is there a lesson in this for us? Yes. Euphemistically speaking, stick to Pepsi. <laughs> Jim Emerald. Say goodnight, Wayne. Good night, Wayne. <laughs> That's it for New Center 4 tonight. I'm Jim Payne. I have a great weekend. And I'm Emerald Yeh for Sylvia Chase. As we leave you tonight, a look at a concert that sold out faster than Bruce Springsteen. It was country music tonight at the Oakland Coliseum featuring the mother and daughter team, the Judds. Good night. <laughs> Thank you.